You won't believe how cultural pulse is transforming brand storytelling through the power of first languages and multicultural insights. Everyone is a hero of their own story. And everyone can succeed in life or fail, but there is a story behind it. What do you say to these people? The Cain and Abel story. Mm. Two brothers playing against each other. You see, whenever two brothers play against each other in the AFL, it generates because it's a, it's a storytelling archetype that's seared into our brains. Fires because, you know, Lee Kuan Yew from Singapore once called Australia white trash. If you look at the Arabic world, did not want Australia to join the Asian Football Confederation. They didn't, weren't comfortable with Australia's history. They wanted Australia excluded. No. Um, what I would do, I would just go to my, the people that I know from my race, from my culture, and suddenly I start living in the ghetto. Like we're buying submarines that aren't ready until 2036. Yeah. I mean, that feels like the most absurd decision. Hey guys, can you all halt your invasions, whatever, whatever's coming or whatever they're being bought for, can you hold on until 2036 till we're ready? Patrick Skin, thank you so much for being here today. I was waiting for, for this episode for a long time and I've been chasing you desperately. Um, and I was looking at well, how do I start this conversation with you? The king of storytelling, the number one storyteller in Australia and maybe around the world. I'm not sure. We'll have to discuss that in details. But also, you are talented, gifted, a simple, uh, or could be not a simple comment on LinkedIn. We get you hundreds of views and hundreds of comments and people are really engaged with you. So today is not about a story, today about the story of Patrick Skin. You are the story today, and we are all here to listen to you in details. How did it all start from your point of view? We will talk about cultural polls again in details and the waves you make in the market um, in this field. But before we start with anything, let's go back to your early startup, your early childhood. Who is Patrick Skin? So Patrick Skeen is a product of Western Sydney. So I grew up uh, in outside Campbelltown and went to school outside Campbelltown. A place I went to school was a Marist Brothers school, high school. That's where my kids go. And I will always credit the Marist Brothers till my dying breath for uh, instilling in me a love of reading, a love of the written and spoken word, and their discipline was outstanding. So... There is some negatives about there about, you know, some parts of the, of the Catholic private school system, but I can't speak more, more highly of it. And I also learnt, uh, at high school was the love of story. And that just came through relentless reading and understanding that there was a whole mechanics to it, which I found amazing. And when I went into, um, the wider world, uh, marketing at that time was the closest thing to to telling a story, or where you where where you, where you could tell stories. So high school was um, was fantastic. I, I I have no complaints, and couldn't believe when I look back, uh, couldn't believe the quality of education that I had from these brothers. We got taught by actual robed brothers who had devoted their whole life and shared everything they could with us. And I remember looking forward to my English class, dreading maths, just because it was so exact and so <laughs> black and white and, 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 and English was so open to interpretation and people's personal styles and, and take on things. They're a shaping force. My mother, um, who was of Irish heritage, uh, she was an English teacher as well. So I had that advantage of home of having someone who understood how to teach, mm -hmm. teaching me. So that was uh, an advantage I'm, I'm very grateful for. And it was a working class slash middle class existence, which made me appreciate things, made me appreciate sport. Uh, sport was, uh, was a huge part of my life. I played a representative cricket and, uh, played soccer to a good level, played a little bit of rugby league, played some rugby union, helped start a rugby union club mm -hmm. uh, back in the day. So I had that multi-sport existence growing up, the tennises and golfs so I'm quite quite competent at. But I look at now uh, with my son 
seems much harder to get them to do the multiple things we had in our time. Obviously, which things was have changed. Pre-internet, yeah. pre, pre everything. But I think one, one sacrifice has been they get very good at games online. They used to be good at multiple games offline and the cost of things. As well, if you if your kid plays representative soccer, it's between fifteen hundred and three thousand. So, what was your dream when you was a, when you were a kid? What was your dream? Did you say, "Um, one day I'm gonna be the best storyteller in the whole universe," or how did it come up to you? Storytelling doesn't have an industry. The closest thing you'll see is branded branded content. Mm-hmm. Storytelling itself is hard to monetize. And in every culture, there are storytellers. In Ireland, they're called the Shonahi, and they wander from town to town, and people feed them, and they tell them Irish mytholo- mythological stories mm-hmm. in a proper storytelling way. And my mother's from a place called Ballyshannon. That's her, her roots in Ireland, which is the poet poetry and folk mm-hmm. capital of Ireland. It's a tiny little town. But over there, telling stories is the most normal normal thing on earth to convey information to to make something stick and i remember being in a pub when i was very young a pub called the millstone which has been knocked down in ballyshannon and i remember seeing a shauna he come in everybody surrounded him they gave him a feed first he'd come from wherever and he told stories about the tuatha tuanan who are the the foundation giants of of irish mythology and i remember still remember it to this day mm. uh that that was such a part of the culture. I remember many moons ago, I made a documentary on the history of West Indies cricket. I helped produce a, a documentary. So I was down in the Caribbean. And there they would talk about the griots. And the griots were storytellers who would go from plantation to plantation and tell the kids African stories about their heritage. That's what we have in our culture too. He storytellers was, are like, they, they used to be the prime players in the society. Yeah. Where we grew up. Yeah. Well, you go back to the Sumerians the, and, and, and Egypt, where next to royalty were the scribes. Mm. And the scribes really are either creating the stories or taking them down and adding a bit of GST for the, uh, for, to, to make that ruler or whoever is the recipient of storytelling happy. But if you look at the first book that we know of, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Sumerians, they found it, uh, they ex- excavated it from, from Nineveh, the old Christian part of, of, of Iraq. And it was the Epic of Gilgamesh. And that spoke about a quest. Gilgamesh goes and he, he, and in that very first story, the first recorded story that we, that we have as part of that quest was a sports story. So Gilgamesh res- res- wrestles Enkidu, who mm-hmm. is two thirds human and half God. And they have a wrestle. There's marketing, you know, Gilgamesh has the force of a thousand waves crashing, so there's even marketing, and then they fight. It's a classic wrestling match. They Enkidu gets flips, Gilgamesh wins, they shake hands afterwards, so we even have sportsmanship. Mm-hmm. And there it is in the very first recorded story. Now, we used to have, when we think stories in Australia, they... We don't have the great, uh, excluding the Aboriginal community, which has, and that's a, a separate thing to discuss, which has, they have stories there that record geological events mm. from 11,000 years ago. Stories about when certain mountains chucked fire near Geelong, and they've, they've dated now that those mountains were active volcanoes 11,000 years ago. Stories of Islands that were there that were co- covered up in the sea rising in the Younger Dryas period, where they've still got stories. There were islands out there. Port Phillip Bay, they used to say that was good kangaroo ground that everyone went. What are you talking about? And then they found out Port Phillip Bay only filled in five or 6,000 years ago. It was once grassy, great hunting territory. Mm. So the Aboriginal storytelling is unbelievable. Just campfire to campfire, keeping it alive about major things that people saw. And there was such trust in the stories in the Aboriginal community that people just believed it and didn't change it. So in general, does your story need to be um, true? Does it have to be some truth in it? Or it doesn't matter if it sounds good, people will love it and people will will hear it anyway. What is your perception on that? So my perception is it's a mixture of both. If it's true, it can be very valuable. But like The Boy Who Cried Wolf, which is a classic story, 
uh, whether there was ever a, originally a boy that cried wolf or the Brothers Grimm, those terrifying fairy tales that the Germans used to threaten their kids with, basically. So yeah. stories can have an, an almost sinister role of bringing fear. And if you look at a lot of stories, religious stories, half of them are beautiful and half of them have a lesson in there to not do something to align with what lifestyle uh, they want you to lead. What's a recent story you've experienced recently and you would like, there was a lesson out of it and you'd like to share it with our viewers? Something that is related to our real life now. In the, sto the story I posted on, on LinkedIn today, there's a guy called Bryson DeChambeau who just won the US Open. And he was for years painted as the selfish rogue, the face of selfish golf, didn't really interact with fans, took the big Saudi Arabia money. And I thought he'd been written off as the bad guy, as, as the villain. Hmm. So he's gone and played in Saudi Arabia and he's somewhere, someone has intervened with him. He's obviously, obviously had his road to Damascus moment or someone has taken him under his arm and says, you know, you're projecting insecurities here with this bad boy image. You're, you're actually a nice guy. So he started engaging with fans, giving interviews, being vulnerable. His dad died. He started talking about it and he has undergone a chemical transformation in his personality where he's gone from villain to the most loved guy mm. in golf. And the, the, the post I put out this morning was of, of him fist bumping a, a kid in a wheelchair who's got cerebral palsy. So he's in the last, just about to go on to the back nine on the final round of the US Open. He's deadlocked or within one stroke of Rory McElroy. He should be, but he's so happy and confident in himself that he's fist bumping all the crowd. Golfers are generally surly and focused. They're, you have to have tunnel vision and it requires incredible concentration because one, one mistake can lose you the tournament. So I love that. I love redemption stories. I love the fact that people can get a second chance, that can, people can become someone else because we, we live in a world where there's a lot of gotcha moments. So people will catch you. You might have shoplifted or said a said a racist thing or made us made it made it made a stupid mistake where a whole lot of circumstances may have led to 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 you being cancelled or you becoming an outcast and australia itself is actually the land of the second chance we are built on originally on 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 on, on convicts coming out here on people wanting a new life as far as the european migration People came down here that were that were locked out of owning property. They were locked out of anything, and they got this second chance for their family line. And you look at the Italians and the Greeks and the Lebanese, mm. and, and 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 how amazingly they've gone often fr from leaving surf-like situations. Not all, uh, but sometimes surf-like situations where yeah, they were they were expendable, Sorry. got booted off the land, kicked off the land, uh, either at military, you know, or you know from economic lack of economic mobility. And they came out here and they got a second life. So I, I, I like to see transformation stories. I like to see redemption stories in particular, because I think we, we all make mistakes. We can all come with a second, you know, as, as, as Jesus said, you know, if no one should throw, he who hasn't sinned cast, cast the first stone. It's in all of the, I look at the Bible as great philosophy mm. outside whether, you know, whether you live by it or not. It's the philosophy in there is providing guardrails for life is amazing. So I love redemption stories. George Foreman's another redemption mm. was a hated. You, you watch the documentaries against Ali. He played the villain with hated, brought German shepherds to press conferences in Africa, knowing that the German shepherd was the tool of the Belgian oppressors in the Congo. They feared that dog because it was used to, mm. to, to manage the curfews in Belgium. But he turns up without the villain, has almost, almost dies in the ring, completely turns around, comes out with the George Foreman grill, turns around, becomes one of the most loved boxing commentators, this big fluffy character, wins the heavyweight title again at the age of 45, this new person. So he went from villain to the most lovable guy. They're the stories I love when you see a chemical transformation of someone. For my stories and how I pick stories, because in my work I do a lot of storytelling, there's about 30 different story archetypes out there. And by archetypes, I mean types of stories. A lot of them are, are biblical, like the prodigal son, when someone leaves a sporting team to go on the great adventure and they return to that sporting team with wisdom. Uh, the Cinderella story, 
the Cain and Abel story, mm. two brothers playing against each other. You see, whenever two brothers play against each other in the AFL, it generates, because it's a, it's a storytelling archetype that's seared into our brains. It's in our DNA as, as what we want to hear about. There has to be struggle. There has to be suspense. Uh, often there's, in rivalries, there's an antagonist and a pro protagonist. Rivalry is another great storytelling option mm. you have when, you know, against the guys across the other side of the river. Uh, in, and in some way, sports become a replacement for war. If you look at some parts of the world like Papua New Guinea, where two tribes used to go against each other, now they play now they play football. I love those stories. So there's, there's a lot of different archetypes. Everything sits off the hero's journey, I, I believe, mm-hmm. um, because the hero's journey w- was coined by Joseph Campbell, a great author in the uh, in the 20th century, and he studied 200-odd uh, ancient cultures and found that there was one type of story that ran through them, this reluctant hero that goes on a quest to improve the conditions of their people. They've got a unique skill set mm-hmm. or talent. You see it in Star Wars. You see it in Nemo, you see it, and it's been used as a Hollywood storytelling device mm. that can't lose. Rocky. So what would you say to um, to the people here? Like people are watching you and uh, from my understanding, everyone is a hero of their own story You're and right. everyone can just um, succeed in life or fail, but there is a story behind it. What do you say to these people who are just hiding their stories and just... Don't let everyone know about their stories, like, or talk about their stories in in more open way. I think they are the exciting people on this earth because they are, when offered an opportunity to tell their story, they decline. That's humility. That may be privacy as well. That may be I don't want other things exposed that will come from a thorough forensic look at my life. But you have people out there, and they're often the real heroes. My first book was on a rugby league player called Olsen Filipina, Mm. who was one of the first big-time Pacific players to come across and try their luck in Sydney in what was the New South Wales Rugby League before the NRL. And when they left New Zealand, they weren't allowed to play for New Zealand anymore. So it was a big, big thing. And and Olsen didn't want to come. But it took me... and. He was a reluctant hero. His mum said, you have to come. And if you know Polynesian cultures, they're collectivist societies. You, list, have, you have to do what, yeah. your, what your, what your mum says. We all, every culture had to do that at one stage, but we've, uh, you know, some, some have moved away from that, you know, direct parental a- obedience, but he had to do what his mother said. He came over here. He endured significant racism, was looked like somebody coming over to take Aussie jobs yeah. back then. And he didn't want to do it, but he, Stuck at it, three years of depression, terrible, endured racism, didn't want to be here, but stuck it out because of his mother. And because if he failed, a lot of people would say, well, Olsen didn't make it. He was the best player over there. Why should we even try? So he had a higher obligation to his people. And I mapped that book against the hero's journey. It it fitted perfectly. The reluctant hero uh, gets called to action by his people. He says, no, I don't want to. gets called again takes the leap of faith across the great divide or the chasm, faces the road of trials, which he did. Mentors appear miraculously to manifest the journey that you've taken a risk on. It's incredible how that happened when when people take that risk. Then you face the dragon in the den. You slay the dragon, whatever the dragon is, and then you bring the magic potion back to your people where either of it's, there's new land over there, we can graze our sheep, or... You can make it over here as a football, whatever the quest was, because it was often a tribe mm. saving quest. So those heroes stick out. We wouldn't have this if it wasn't for X in our past, in our genealogy. But it goes back to what you said. So Joseph Campbell, after he finished this book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, he said it's actually everybody is the hero of the, everybody's got, can ignite a hero's journey. It just takes bravery because he said, his most famous quote is, the cave you seek not to enter holds the treasure you seek. Correct. And that was his his line. So it's about that moving towards hugging your monsters, moving towards the uncomfortable place, because on the other side of fear, whatever it is, lies a, a form of happiness 
that you are fulfilling your best dreams or feel mentally that you're something close to what you should be doing on this earth. Because if we define what happiness is, yep. that's probably where it is. The beekeeper that wanted to be a beekeeper is a beekeeper or someone that quit the rat race and took half pay salary to do a creative project, but they're happy. Um, and that's why you see a lot of people teetering after a while in the corporate world. Some people find it early. They're very lucky. There's songs about it. There's stories about it, about finding your thing, finding the thing. Everybody's got their their thing and you've got to find that. And when you're a parent, it's a it can be a source of anxiety on making sure your kid finds that. Is it guitar? Is it um is it cricket? Is it the arts? Yeah. Is it public speaking? Do they love maths? Do they, do, can they because mathematics is a beautiful, beautiful language and and some people don't get developed in it and they're very good at it because they found that um you know things like math, sport, whatever it is, um talent is distributed equally but opportunities aren't so that's why they go to africa and they find these incredible footballers uh because they never had the the, the pathway up 100 percent. so for storytellers there is no pathway there's no conferences it's a weird i mean two industries storytelling and multicultural marketing which are both unmeasurable wild wests as far as they've got you know, a little bit of an awards. There's no real storytelling awards. Who told us? It's either publishing or PR or communications. It, it all has to fit under its corporate bracket to the point where if you call people a story, if you put down storytellers, your prime thing, um, people think, you know, how do you make money? But if you say I'm a brand storyteller, which is what copywriters are now converting themselves to, I see it on LinkedIn now that people are saying I'm a brand storyteller. Because brands are now realizing, I just can't say three bullet points and say what this product is. I've got to have my customer as the hero of the story. My audience have to see themselves in the customer. The customer has to be genuinely, authentically happy using my product. And that's the brand story. Talk about the end state. So obviously you found a gap in traditional marketing and you said, okay, this is my power. I, I am a good storyteller. And there is um, this segment of this society, the multicultural society side, that brands are not reaching out to them. So you created Cultural Pulse, uh, which was a link between brands and multicultural uh, audiences. Yeah. Did you find a weakness in traditional marketing and said, okay, this is an opportunity for me or... How did it come up to you? So I was working at the Sydney Kings and when I, got, I was a sales and marketing director of the Sydney Kings, that was my last uh, role before Cultural Pulse. And I used to look at the half empty building when I would go to watch and say, wow, this is a global sport. I don't see any Asians. Mm. They're playing. There's a Filipino competition, an Indonesian competition. There's the Australian Chinese Basketball Association, but they're not here. So they either haven't heard the story of the Sydney Kings or they don't see themselves or the story they have heard, they don't see themselves in it as part of it. So I went in there and one of my main missions was to take the Kings out to Asian communities. So we had theme nights. Uh, we had a Filipino night that ended up in 300 more membership for the Kings. And if you work at a sport, second tier sport, a jump of 300 is very exciting. They come mm -hmm. in twos, fours, sixes. And what I learned when I spoke to the Filipinos, they said, yeah, we saw an ad. It was in Tagalog, Filipino language, and we felt grateful. We felt included. And I, and I thought, isn't that the thing? Sometimes it's not the fact that they've read something in language, there's a, there's, there's a more base instinct that's generated, and that is gratitude that you've noticed us. Because multicultural marketing used to be, we'll try and fit every race into one TVC or one, one piece of creative, like the old Benetton ads. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. They had one stereotypically visual person from each and was like, we are the world. And when diversity and inclusion, which is the, uh, the industry that multicultural you can say falls under but diversity and inclusion often becomes compliance how many people do you have on the board of this group and it gets it's a tangled hr concept now but whereas multicultural marketing is you know sydney's 55 percent one or more parent born overseas sydney's one in three asian heritage 
Are you marketing to them or are you negligently just marketing the same old one size fits all ads and trying to catch everybody and wondering where's my growth going to come from? Mm. Because you'll see it in the Western world, there's declining fertility rates. It's gone through the floor. To get out to a third kid is a major decision that in many ways only the collectivist families, the ones who still have run extended families living in the same house and the wealthy can afford to have six kids. Mm. In the old days, the Catholics would have six kids, but now they say two, maybe three, because it takes X hundred thousand dollars to take a kid after tax dollars to take a kid from zero to 18. And we can't afford it. We won't be able to travel overseas. And it becomes, it's, so with these declining fertility rates, um, it's the growth is not coming from the Anglo Celtic or European markets. Everyone's settled. Everyone's having two kids. It's actually below replacement rate. It's the migrants that are having the kids. It's the migrants that are coming in and providing growth. And the migrants aren't unskilled people anymore. Mm. In the old days, we had people to come in and do the cleaning, do the jobs we wouldn't do. I'm, I've got a mate of mine who's, uh, who's Greek in the city and he still owns a cafe there. And I call him the last of the 4 a.m. Greeks. <laughs> Because it used to be the Greeks that got up, went to market, they prided themselves on that hard work. That was their way to get the jump That's and correct. get ahead, to do the stuff other people didn't want to do. Now the Greeks are getting their houses cleaned. They're successful now. Uh, their kids grow up hearing about maybe dad's or granddad's struggle. Probably a Greek now is rarely going to get the racism they got in the playground, particularly as schoolyards are multicultural in the metros at least mm. and so we see this um but the, the the migrants coming in now are highly skilled they're ready to buy things and the greatest honor you can do a multicultural community is treat them like a market and people go "Ooh, but yes i don't want to be treated like a problem you look at the african communities the only marketing they see is knife play terrorism whatever and it gets you down nobody wants to be judged on their bottom 10 percent but uh, that's the problem. So mm. we love connecting real corporate sponsors up with multicultural communities because it makes the multicultural community feel better because it's acknowledgement that you have discretionary spend. Mm. It's acknowledgement that you consume. It's respectful not to just treat you like you're a problem to be to be solved. Correct. So you work with the sports yeah. uh, specifically? or Well, we work with sports are about 30 to 40% of our business. Mm -hmm. So you've got education and you have tourism. We have, e we have education, we have tourism, we have fast-moving consumer goods. So how do you capitalize on education and tourism? And how do you do the link also between... Well, education, uh, because the big link here is that if someone comes from overseas, they have almost certainly taken the advice of someone from the diaspora here. Yeah. From a, no one makes a blind leap. So marketing to the diaspora here, and this is a big one to get into clients' heads, marketing, whether you're a bank, because by the time the person doesn't register for a bank when they're at Sydney Airport, and you see some of the banks out there like, come and I'm not going to sign up when I've just landed at the airport even if you've got translated mm. materials it will already have been done their friend here will have said go to anz anz is close to where we're going to be living there's an indian banker there who's a good guy it's already lined up if you look at indian tourism down here 70 percent is visiting friends and relatives so the diaspora here the indian community here which is getting close to a million chinese is 1.4 million now we have education two things one is the diaspora here has heavy influence on who comes down where they live what 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 purchasing and second is if you look at the next century as being the india and chinese century which some people say is the case we are educating a lot of future princelings and princesslings of the corporate world sometimes royalty mm. in who australia is what it is if you remember the Roman Empire at its peak, it educated people from the provinces and they had an understanding of Rome. So, and uh, as some people have a negative uh, student experience, let's not discount that. But four years here, you'll, I think you'll get a balanced view of what Australia is and it demystifies. If, if you can survive four years. If yeah. you can survive and it demystifies because, you know, Lee Kuan Yew from Singapore once called Australia white trash. If you look at the Arabic world, did not want Australia to join the Asian Football Confederation. They didn't 
weren't comfortable with Australia's history. They wanted Australia excluded. That was a very complex thing, but still, that's a big thing to mm. being voted against. We saw the world turn against us in that Olympic Olympic, but we don't have as much influence, external influence as maybe we thought we did through being a member of AUKUS, uh, you know, linking up. There's there's work to be done in Asia, so education is an incredibly important thing, and tourism is the same. Chinese tourists look for very different things than Anglo tourists do. Um, Indian tourists will look for, like Chinese tourists aren't interested in the outback, for example. Japanese can't get enough of the outback. Yeah, They love the ancient Aboriginal culture, uh, and Japanese are heavily linked to their ancient culture. They've got Ainu, they've got an Aboriginal group sitting in Japan, so they have some empathy there. But uh, so different tourist, so marketing the same good old Anglo Aussie tourist attractions mm. to people that have different behaviours, different things they want out of tours. Like the Chinese will go to Sovereign Hill because they get to Gold Pan. How simple. How elegant. 150,000 Chinese tourists will go there to recreate in a fake environment. Okay, so let me ask you this question because when we first arrived to Australia, cultural diversity was, um, was something really pleasurable. Um, we got engaged in the Australian society. We've met different races. We met different groups. Now, after all of these years, Personally, I'm feeling that there is walls between that, that have been raised between those yeah. cultures. Yeah. People are not talking to each other anymore. Yeah. Even within the same culture, there's a gap. There's a miscommunication between the two. Yeah. How can cultural poles help um, from this perspective? Or is there any remedy for it? I'm not sure. It's very interesting. We did the 2015 Asian Cup. AFC Asian Cup, which everybody thought was going to be a dud. We had the multicultural marketing account for that. They said no one's going to turn up to Asian football. They're all ranked between 30 and 150 in the world. No one cares. It was a massive success. And we had uh, 300 community ambassadors as part of that program. And we said to them, it was very interesting. We said, we, we did a series of tests, and one of the startling ones was n over 90% said they felt more Australian by acknowledging their ancestral identity and not being made to choose or, 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 or put that down. They actually felt more Australian because in that program we allowed their ancestral identity to, to breathe and be celebrated alongside their – they really felt they were representing Australia mm. as well. And that was – we use that example often in the assimilation <clears throat> always creates resentment, telling you to not go to your church, not eat your food, not speak your language, not use that accent, the way to dress. That breeds an intergenerational resentment that never, that never leaves, that you ask people to surrender things, you know, the, the traditions of their grandparents. It's a big thing. So we had a magic period that you speak of, or which I lived through as well, where people were encouraged to become Australian in certain ways, but not to surrender. So to come up with what they call the dual identity. Come up, you're both. And if they play each other in soccer, you're happy either way. You shouldn't have to be in an us versus them. But if you look at Australian history, the early Australians suffered a terrible abandonment complex. They were sent here for the term of their natural life. You can never return, never return to your homeland, and that's a big thing. And the fact that Britain has been able to manipulate us to still be run by the British, in a way, is, is, is a masterstroke in PR and marketing and exploiting insecurities because just imagine that. And then a lot of Italians, when they came out here, those... Uh, European migrants after World War II, they kind of felt abandoned. They came out in boats and either were pushed out by a military junta or whatever the situation was, they were abandoned people. And that's that's traumatising to not be and, – and so we've had this abandonment complex, as, as anyone would, if you got sent to this strange, harsh land where things can kill you and kookaburras wake you up at 5 o'clock and it's dry – and uh, it's not seasons. Some of the trees just go on forever. Um, 
you know, it's it's a dry, hard land, and we had pioneers perish trying to to conquer it. So we've got migrants now, but what what we've seen the change has happened is this: we are now starting to demonize each other and our histories Mm. and there is a log where you are branded an oppressor or oppressed or a victim or a victimizer and this happens within communities as well and 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 around communities when everybody agreed to this grand leveling up um, it was never meant to be because multiculturalism doesn't work when when any culture is demonized including the host culture now, people say, what's this host culture got right got to be here with the Aboriginals? Well, that's any settler society. That's Argentina. That's virtually all of South America. Hmm. Um, and if you look at England, there's had the Romans there for 400 years. Uh, the French were there for another 500 years after that. It, there's, the history is, 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 is very, very complex. But here, we've dropped Anzac Day. Uh, people are now guilty of celebrating Australia Day. We're in a really unique place where... Anglo-Celtic culture is, which is far from perfect, but it's being demonized and migrants aren't respecting it. Mm. When your parents came down, people respected the culture. They may not have agreed with everything, but they respected the fact that these institutions led to things working, a quality of life. Um, Migrants may have found certain parts of Anglo-Celtic culture to be sort of empty and soulless. There's no street life. Really, after hours, things shut down. It literally shut down at 6 6 p.m. It was yeah, very, which is killing for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Well, people came from these vibrant street cultures, but and that's a beautiful example of the Italians and Greeks and others, Lebanese, bringing down parts of that later night street culture where you can go and have a coffee. So tell me something. As a migrant, I just arrived to Australia, and um, there's no induction for me. Yeah. So straight away, um, what I would do, I would just go to my the people that I know from my race, from my culture, and suddenly I start living in a ghetto instead yeah. of being open and induced in the society. Um, we're creating yeah, we're islands within the big island. We are. What do we do with this? Well, w- the only way out of that is strong leadership and role models. <clears throat> so there would have been someone you saw who was proudly Lebanese, but also proud Aussie, and he provides you a way to do it. You can go out and footy is yours as much as it is, it is the Anglo Kilts. You can have ownership in some of these Aussie institutions because you come down as a migrant, you got Medicare, you got school. They're not joyous things to be institutions to attach yourself to. They're quite functional. But you look at the Lebanese community, the first time a lot of them went out to a Bulldogs game mm-hmm. and they realised because about fifteen percent of, of of the Bulldogs fans are of Lebanese background. We did a survey in two thousand fourteen. Yeah, and they're high value members. They buy the higher value membership packages, so they're they're in. And in the eighties and the nineties with Super League, it was the migrants that stuck to these old clubs when it, when things went went sour because it meant as much to them, if not more, because this was their passport to becoming Aussie, to having colours, to being feeling part of a greater tribe outside their ethnic group to sit next to a couple of Aussies at the game and we're both wearing blue and white, we're in the same thing. And that's where sport, like the arts, is a great expression of culture, but you can't compare a shawarma to a samosa. But sport, there's a score. It's 2-1. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's, 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 it, it's objective. Yeah, all right. You may not have agreed with the referee's decision. I get that. But food and music are, and the, food and music aren't intergenerational either. Generally, most kids don't like the music their grandmother or father liked. It's just different eras do, because everyone likes to have their own stamp. Yeah. Or even dishes. I'm doing a new version of lamb. You know, everyone Fusion, wants. Fusion, yeah. But sports, the one thing that, grandkid and great granddad can go out they can talk about the same players it's, it's the same colors it always was and that's why sport that's why i've landed on sport above other pillars as far as the great unifier whether it's a grassroots and getting people down to those precious green spaces we have in our suburbs where le- everyone mixes the parents go on this shared mission called the season which has a start where everyone's filled with hope New players coming together. The, fer- the parents are screaming out for each other's kids. You feel a sense of love. You might come last. You might come first. 
you committed to be 8.30 in some cold ground in the middle of winter and you went on a shared journey together. And that's, for me, the, the, the essence of sport. And that it's the essence of storytelling. That's that quest mm. that continually comes back in everything. You go on a shared quest. That's all working together is. You're on a shared quest, whether it's a project basis or working for an employer to grow the company, to save the company. They're all quests. So if I ask Patrick now, Patrick, can you write a story, like a short story about the future or the role of cultural diversity in modern Australia? What is the role of cultural diversity in modern Australia, given that the whole planet, the whole globe has been coming just one village, really? I think we're talking about respect. So cultural diversity, not asking people to... I, and as long as it's within Australian laws cover off on certain things. So if it's in breach of Australian law, well, there are cultural practices that are, are, are unwelcome and are covered by legislation and laws. But I think the damage we're doing right now is migrants coming down are, are seeing that Australian culture is disrespected, is not strong. It's this Anglo Celtic culture. And I think that's where people are then not provided any incentive to engage with that, with, with that culture, even the way, the way things are cooked. And I think Australia at its greatest and, 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 and that's where cultural diversity also has to stand, extend both ways. Anglo Celtic people and Aboriginal people have to respect each other first. That's a, a huge work in process. Uh, whereas uh, Aboriginal people have been let down continually, even those that went to serve in the war mm. weren't given land settlements when they came back, but the white soldiers were. And if I'd heard that about my grandpa, I'd have extreme anger because that's the generational wealth that should be flowing down to families that are not. So when people say, how come the Aboriginals aren't getting ahead? Well, other, other groups did have a head start. Mm. That needs to be addressed. There's stolen wages claims in Queen. This is not... These are people that are still alive that had their wages garnished by an employer for no reason. That if it was, if, if they were white, absolutely that would be. So there's, there, there, there's a gap there. I look at New Zealand that has a treaty, race relations there. Uh, yeah, they, they still need work, but because the, the Anglo Celtic people have a, 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 a legal right to be there, there's less anger in the, in, in, in the dealings. Mm. So we've got that. And then we've got how, uh, the white and Aboriginal community feel about the migrants the aboriginal community like people just keep coming in what are they learning about us as the original host culture and now it's moved to what are they learning about the anglo culture it's the, a different the, a completely different game the second migration <laughs> or migration sliver what are, what are we learning about each other was well, john f kennedy once said we fear what we do not understand correct and if cultural diversity is framed as an educational process there's good bits of everywhere um but there's the melting pot, there's the salad bowl model, there's the assimilation model, you have to become us if you come here, and there's the integration model where we integrate in but we keep, there's all these different different models. The integration model is the one I, I see is the best which relies on people respecting those coming in and those coming in respecting who already here and what works, what why they wanted to, to come here. Um, I remember there was a, an English politician called Jack Straw, and people, this was wildly controversial, who said, just like you didn't have an induction, that the migrants should be inducted on the queue. Because if you look at the queue here, when the queue breaks down in Australia, because there's fights, taxi lines, pool tables, ATM lines, pubs lining up when someone cuts in, someone cuts in in traffic. The one thing that people really is you really unique about Australia that people love is it is egalitarian. Mm. There's no one that can walk in front of the ATM line in front of you and not break the law or break Australian customs. In other, so Jack Straw, I think was his name, said we should induct migrants about the queue because if you don't come from a, a country that has the queue, you just charge onto the train. Hundred percent. He got called racist, and I remember feeling at the time, I don't think that's unreasonable. Where, because when the queue breaks down, society breaks down. It's that simple. It becomes a free for all. There's no women on first. There's no step aside for the old people. Uh, it, it, it dies. And I remember when he got called racist, I remember feeling very uncomfortable at that because I knew what he was trying to get at. 
and people just said this that that's racist and it just shuts down the conversation and then people start to form stereotypes once those stereotypes are are, are, are locked in they're very difficult to like polynesians are lazy rugby league players all right you hear that there's been some incredible Polynesian players, Correct. <laughs> but this thing just lingers. People suffocate under it because once you have a stereotype, you don't have to think anymore. Just beautiful. I'll just file that person under that and I don't have to think. Please. Look, there is a fight um, inside of me. I like a fight against myself and am I doing the right thing, the right choice to keep my kids in Australia, yeah. to grow in Australia? And the reason for that, I'm, I'm watching a migration from the cities, from traditional Australians or mm. white Anglo-Saxons or whatever you want to call them in a non-racist way to the countryside. And this country being di- getting divided into sectors and. Well, you can say that's already happened in, 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 in London. You can say that's already happened in LA. There's, there's a, a well documented demographic concept called white flight and it had started in america where they white whites just left the inner cities to the point where san francisco is like it and they leave behind so they take the tax a lot of the tax base with them and they move out to wherever the out they move to the outer suburbs where they can replicate as closely as they can their childhood and london is now 31 percent anglo-celtic 69% 69% n- non-English born overseas, however you want to view that, multicultural. <clears throat> it's happening in Sydney and, and definitely Western Sydney, uh, where the, the, the Anglo-Celtic migrants are cashing out, moving to Central Coast or out to the region. And it's pretty obvious. Yeah, and that's that's because that's not just, I think it's just because of the congestion. Um, Sydney was never designed to be four and a half, five million, or, or GWS, the largest, six million, if you look at the driving catchment. So there's congestion, there's wanting to play cricket on the streets and, 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 and the preferences, sporting preferences that they had. It's happening. And no one can talk about it. There's a taboo talking about Anglo Celtics as a racial group mm. because they are the oppressors, they're the colonizers in that hard left narrative. So there's no discussion that can be had, and these things are happening that are that are drastically changing communities. And uh, there's now white people that won't live in large parts of Sydney, won't even consider moving there, just like migrants in the old days wouldn't consider to moving to the Shire or Northern Beaches because there's none of their group there. So it has been what you've just outlined is a fascinating concept just that is absolutely overseas concept that's played in front of our eyes here so how can you picture australia um, in the future if i tell you patrick can you draw australia for me yeah uh, i'll, so I'll draw 10 20 years i'll draw up the, the, this because the great quest our thriving our advantage is being connected into the asian middle class buying our stuff um trading sourcing their kids as students to go back there with an understanding of Australia so they'll do business. So I believe Sydney and Melbourne, if they're not already there, become Asian super cities like Singapore where only the wealthy can pay the taxes there and, and live. And then you have satellite satellite cities for the working class who are coming in and doing the service roles. You look at New York. If you own a piece of freehold there, you're un- unbelievably wealthy. It's impossible to even think of buying. Everyone has to buy apartments. Mm. And then they have you buy, you pay key money in New York, like 25000 for the right to rent something. You actually pay a, a major deposit. They, they're able to extract that. You're seeing it now, 70 people lining up outside. Uh, you know, relatively mediocre places for, for the price. So they become super cities. Melbourne and Sydney are already there. Yeah. They're, they're, all, 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 they're, they're going to be close to majority Asian in 10, 20 years. Eurasian mixed the whole thing. You look at the HSC results when they come through in Sydney, Melbourne. I look at them every year. Our captains of industry is overwhelmingly dominated the high marks, which are moving into the professions so the lawyers. That's just the the reality. Now, the, so there's going to be, you know, there's, there'll be driverless cars here. There won't be driverless cars out in the country where there's huge distances and the tech gap can't close it. So you're going to get this, 
And you're seeing it in London where they, they what they call Middle England, which is the old Anglo-Celtic England. They're the Aboriginals of England in a way, if you want to look at it that way. That original English culture lives in Middle England out in the regions. So what you're going to see is the Bathists, the Tamworths, those regional centres are going to be more fun because they've been losing people for a long time. And the reserve, the, the, the tree change, as they call it, moving out to the, to the country is not just about being amongst fresh air and oxygen. It's a being around people that provide a cultural village that's similar to what you grew up in. Mm. So the like, question- like, like, like Cabramatta yep. is a village as close as you'll get in Australia to growing up in, 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 in Vietnam. The food will be there. You can come and chat in first language. I understand why those, what you call ghettos, uh, which we now call foodie, <laughs> foodie hotspots. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I, I understand how they form because Aussies do it in London. All the Aussies used to live around. We ask migrants to do, not to do, exactly what we do when we go overseas. We used to go to Shepherd's Bush and Earl's Court. We would go to London. London is the lowest degree of separation from our culture, yet we still clustered for familiarity, for job opportunities, to meet people, and to be around your own. We can't deny people Mm. wanting to, because when you're talking in first language or about things you know, like Aussies over there, you're talking about footy the news from back home, that your local English people you're working with aren't interested in. And you can be yourself in first language. So the question about uh, what is Australia's position in Asia is not valid anymore. Do we have to look for other questions on where is is Australia in Asia? Um, It will be one of the great trading partners. It will be as an educator of middle-class Asian kids because they respect our universities. And we will start to see, uh, we're seeing, if you look at Kudos Bank Arena, it's getting big K-pop events, big Punjabi events. You're starting to see it at scale in entertainment venues. You're starting to see it when there's vacancies, migrants stepping in on vacant stores because retail still migrants still view retail as 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 a way to get ahead but we get we're going to have a two tier country and out in out in the provinces out in out in the regions will be a more traditional anglo celtic like people laugh at queensland but queensland is really a hold out of of the old aussie Correct. aussie culture and they get mocked and 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 and, and vilified but i don't think Mocking the host culture and denigrating the host culture anywhere in a gra- in the great multicultural experiment ends well, because then that group will not participate in the grand multicultural because they don't feel respected. They feel themselves being like blamed for everything or mocked or or, or their culture denigrated. And there is you either you either say there is a unique Aussie Anglo Celtic culture that's different to England, different to America, or you just say it's a it's a sort of half baked imitation not worthy of you as a migrant participating in and i think that's incredibly dangerous territory so we said we need both sides to everything is about respect i respect your culture we've got these laws don't go outside those laws but outside that q there's some informal ones like q let people in be nice on the roads let's not turn it they're like the road rage in sydney and melbourne Mm is like a real canary in the coal mine for me. So I think a lot of Anglos moving out, A, because they're getting ridiculous amounts for their property in Sydney and Melbourne. B, the kids are grown up and they just want, that they can afford to go out. They don't have to work in Sydney. And this work from home thing has accelerated the phenomena where you only need to be in the mm. office three days. But let's admit that Anglos are still... Uh, controlling the politics of Australia and uh, the change in directions and yeah, well they're, 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 they're the largest they're, they're, the, they're the largest voting block. I think anywhere in the world, if you have the largest voting block, you're still going to be like we're buying submarines that aren't ready until 2036. Yeah, I mean that feels like the most absurd decision. Hey guys, can you all halt your invasions? Whatever, whatever's coming or whatever they're being bought for, can you hold on until 2036 till we're ready? Yep. Um, that's a decision that, you know, if migrants were in charge, they probably wouldn't have, 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 have made. So, so what's your message to the politicians out there? And like, I use the cultural diversity wisely just to position Australia globally, 
I, I, I would say our most dangerous and attractive asset is under fire by people, by dog whistling about racism. But we also have to be open to concerns like Europe, like America, like everywhere. If people feel overrun and their lives are going bad, anyone anywhere is going to scapegoat a, what they believe is the source. The Liberal Party are doing a dangerous uh, ploy in a way on being so anti-migration, whereas um, they can't say we prefer one set of migrants over another because the left will just challenge them. They may be more digestible or in alignment with this source culture, but you've got one side of politics demonising the migrants. You've got the other side of po politics demonising the Anglo-Celtic structures that underpin society, and both of them need to stop that or we'll be at each other's throats. We mm. lose the common contract. We lose the cohesion. We lose the binding. Sport can't do it alone. In fact, once you unbind, sport can go flip the other way and be an actual theatre for some of this stuff to play out. Mm. You saw it, you know, you've, you've seen it in various stage where you've had race-based race stuff at games that we don't want to import here in any, in any major way because that will definitely, like we, we have enough with referee abuse and, and match official abuse in this country, which is endemic, an absolute blind spot. Correct. Look, um, brain splat normally, we, in brain splat, our aim is to talk about technology and yeah. the impact of technology on humans um, overall. Um, as a chief creative officer of Cultural Pulse, how much technology plays a role in your life, in your day-to-day -day activities? And can you live without technology these days? I look at our industry, the multicultural industry, and I've seen really the most incredible changes from when newspapers were absolute, and it's no different to the other side, when newspapers were absolute kings and queens, the centres of their community. The classifieds were a rivers of gold for these papers. And then along came the internet first, uh, which was which incredible for me. So the internet was unbelievable for migrants that they could read an Italian newspaper online every day when you used to have to go to the news agency and get a three-week-old one, or in some cases go down to the consulate reading rooms. At consulates and embassies, in, mm. they used to have reading rooms where the papers would get shipped in under diplomatic, uh, you know, speed, and you would go there and read the newspapers from your if you wanted current news. That was the way, and that was an incredible time. And the circulation rates on newspapers were incredible. Then came the internet, which took out the classifieds first. And the classifieds were the hidden revenue driver of of of, of ethnic media. And there's one Vietnamese newspaper that never went on the internet, Hu Duong, based out of Cabramatta. It's the last surviving national Vietnamese daily because they kept their classifieds in them. And they've got an older demographic who still like to read. And now the youngsters, if they want to buy something, they have to go and look at the newspaper. So that was huge for our space. Then came social media, part two. Mm -hmm. And social media then created a thousand sources of news and and now it, what's truth what's not mastheads have been blasted people stop reading papers so we're in a in a new space where people can now watch tv from india directly like they were living in india the gap has closed unbelievably so we've become much more global but that's at the expense a lot of time of our australian identity so every 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 positive has a little negative tucked in there as well. Patrick Skinner, I can't thank you enough for coming to our podcast today. It has been a fantastic um, episode that I'm, um, I hope that everyone will enjoy it. But before we wrap it up, what is your final message, really, your thoughts to the new generation, the kids who are listening to you right now, and they're a bit lost. They're not sure which way they have to go or what career they have to jump on. What is your message to them? My message is to network. All good jobs come from networking, where trust is already established between people. So network hard, uh, go and do apprenticeships, learn under the older generation. That model still works. And I have great faith. In fact, I think the kids now coming through have more respect. They, 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 they're brought up with, 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 with race diminished as a, as a tool of, of bullying. 
Uh, they there's a whole lot of gender uh, things that are way more acceptable. So I, I have great faith in the kids, but everything comes down to respect and and respect people's backgrounds, where they come from, and empathy. Just walk in other people's shoes and don't judge, because once we judge, we're we're kind of cooked. We, we lock someone into a, an opinion which is not good. Because those who are open minded, AI is coming for a whole range of things, but those that are open minded. Uh, and have those soft people skills like empathy are going to be the ones that move forward. Either in le- you can't lead without empathy now, and keep your language, be proud of your culture, but also embrace uh, embrace your new culture as well and get into it because that's a great sign of respect. Not just to carve out your own little home away from home, but develop that dual identity. I think it's very powerful, and I think they're going to be the winners. Keep your language as well. What a great asset that's going to be in 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 future. Not only can you talk to your grandparents, but you'll be able to transact in a globalized world and you'll have just another asset in your resume. One, what would you say to the families now that are struggling outside in Australia during this time specifically? I, I would say um, to families, migrant and non-migrant, to, to scapegoat the migrants uh, who have uh, equal challenges and are doing it very tough at the moment. A lot of them, a lot of migrants are working f- are, are overqualified for what their working is, which is a very sad thing to do when your qualific- hard qualifications aren't recognised. But I would uh, don't fall into the trap of scapegoating migrants to blame for your personal situation because that always leads to a, a dark place. And if we get along and have a collegiate sense of fraternity with our neighbours of, of, of any colour and we're all, we're all in this together, that's when Australia's at its best. Fantastic. Thank you, Pat. My pleasure. It was Awesome to talk Australia's history, talk about where we're going and talk about where migration sits in that. And it's good to have a nuanced conversation. It's not not something you can have uh, a lot these days because it's very charged on a a number of levels, but an absolute joy to to chat and and great that you did your homework. And it's some things that I haven't talked about in other podcasts, which is uh, is fantastic. So thank you. From addressing gaps in traditional marketing to becoming a leader in multicultural engagement, Patrick's journey is truly inspiring. If you found Patrick's journey as fascinating as we did, leave a comment below with your thoughts. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more inspiring stories and experts' insight. Until next time on the Brain Start Podcast, goodbye.